first of all, Todd here. I mean, we're gathered here, first of all, I think, to congratulate you on making it <laughs> to this stage. Really, I mean, with your dissertation being a real opus, for you, historically, theoretically, your personal, you know, story is in it. Um, and uh, and I, from the start of when we were working together, well, I remember one of the things I was telling you from the beginning was it takes a lot of courage to get into this question that you're opening up. The question of what is the relationship between psyche and matter, you know, um, a question that you take all the way back to ancient Egypt and the way that ancient Egypt's conceptualized that, um, <clears throat> into the alchemical tradition, into the Jungian tradition, into the relationship Jung had with Wolfgang Pauli, that relationship between physics and psychology. You know, one of the definitions of alchemy or the possible etymologies is that alchemy means in Arabic from Egypt, al-chem, from the chem being the dark soil of Egypt. So we are in this tradition, you know, which I can feel historically now with your work, back through your own, back into the alchemical tradition, all the way back to, to Egypt. Um, so it's a, a real opus. Congratulations on, on being here. Um, I want to give you maximum time for your presentation, so I think I'll just leave that to you. Okay. You know, <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll make this here. It's all the other people that will show up. <laughs> okay, Egypt. What does that mean? That single word probably conjures up a variety of images for all of us, for most of us at least. Pyramids, pharaohs, Cleopatra, mummies, magic, mystery, and of course the afterlife. It seems that Egypt and all that it represents makes its presence known in a variety of ways in the Western psyche. Indeed, re referring to several sources, Egypt seems to be a rather common subject, even when the dreamer has never set foot on Egyptian soil or has never given the country much thought in waking life. Also, according to many past life practitioners that I've spoken with, Egypt is a common setting for a past life and many people who investigate their own past lives over an extended period of time will typically come up with a few of Egyptian origin. This special and unique allure that Egypt seems to have in the collective is one of the reasons why I chose this ancient culture as a topic for this research. Although a variety of ancient cultures share many of the mystical and spiritual elements of Egypt's history, Egypt still stands out from the others. One of the most significant reasons Egypt is the focus of this research is that Egypt actually chose me. I've always been intrigued with this mysterious place. And beginning with a very vivid dream I encountered when I was about 11 years old, I've been fascinated with anything that is Egyptian. Another good reason to use Egypt as a central focus of this research is the enormous amount of scholarly study that an interest in Egypt has generated over the years not only in conventional archaeology, but more importantly, considering the thrust of this particular research in alternative history and spirituality. There has also been a lot of attention aimed at Egyptian cosmology and religion from researchers in depth psychology, such as Theodore Abt, Eric Harnick, and Tom Cavalli. So, other than these important factors in considering Egypt for this research, what is it about Egyptian cosmology that relates to our modern times? How can an understanding of ancient Egyptian sacred science bring soul back into our current materialist paradigm? How do the concepts of soul magic and sacred science as defined by the ancient Egyptians relate to the lack of soul in modern materialism? And what can psychotherapists do to bring the concept of ancient Egypt's sacred science and magic into their practice and how would it benefit their patients? These questions are among the research questions specifically asked in this dissertation which is titled, as you all know, Ancient Egyptian Sacred Science and the Loss of Soul in Modern Materialism. So, first of all, what is sacred science? What is soul? And what is materialism? The easiest of these three to define is materialism. Very simply put, it is the belief that anything real is physical in nature and thus is made up of material substance, can be measured objectively, etc. Anything that is not material therefore, is not real. The term sacred science, as it pertains to ancient Egyptian cosmology, was used by the eminent scholar and researcher Schwaller de Lubitz. De Lubitz was a modern alchemist who spent a good many years 
with his wife Aisha in Egypt studying the Karnak Temple complex in Luxor. His work, although quite esoteric, sheds considerable light on ancient Egyptian cosmology and spirituality. Sacred science is a phrase used to describe a science that was practiced giving full credence to the unseen, inner, and non-material nature of reality. Jeremy Nadler, a contemporary Egyptian scholar, said, in contrast to the modern secular awareness of the world, the Egyptians were aware that the world they lived in was not simply physical, not simply <coughs> visible, but both physical and non-physical, both visible and invisible. And even more unlike the modern view, they regarded the invisible or interior world as in many respects more important and more real than the visible exterior world. There was a sacredness in the spiritual concerns of the ancient Egyptians, just as there is a sacredness in our contemporary spiritual concerns. But for the Egyptians, there was always a sacredness that was honored and practiced in not only their spiritual concerns, but in their science and architecture mathematics, and the other hard sciences. There was no separation of the divine and the material world. Soul is a bit more difficult to define. There are as many descriptions and definitions of soul as there are different ways to describe love or God or any of these other very difficult to define concepts. One thing most of these definitions do have in common is that soul cannot be measured as a material object with weight and mass. Well, there are several people through history that have tried to do this with various, various methods. As far as his research is concerned, most definitions of soul would suffice. Philip Cousineau probably presents soul most succinctly in this quote. From Pharaonic Egypt to Delta Blues Clubs, from the marble marble Deborah of, of classical Athens to the white, vast white tundra of Arctic hunters, belief in an uncanny force at the heart of things has been intuited a sleep strange feeling rooted in a presence of tremendous impact that circulates through and animates all of nature. So what was so special about the ancient Egyptian cosmology and what did they do that we don't do today? They infused this uncanny force, to use Cousineau's term, into everything that they did. They believed that the material world as well as their inner imaginary world was infused with spirit and spirits. And not only did they believe this in their minds and hearts, they created with their hands some of the most technologically advanced material manifestations known, all while holding this wholly integrated belief about reality. When I went to Egypt for the first time in 1992, I was already intrigued by what I had read and what conventional science had to say about what the Egyptians had done during their 5,000 year culture. However, once I arrived, I was astounded by what I actually saw and knew immediately that most of what I had read made little sense in explaining what I was actually experiencing. Due to limited time, I will share only one of these experiences, one of the very last sites that we visited in Egypt, and this was at the Serapium. This is the sacred Apis bull burial ground, made up of a few dozen or so underground chambers. And this little map shows basic setup of the Serapium. Many chambers at one time housed a huge granite sarcophagus in which a mummified bull was encased. These boxes, these Serapian, these uh, sarcophagi boxes weigh in excess of 70 tons. They are about 10 feet high, 13 feet long, and 8 feet wide. The precision in which they are built is incomprehensible, and the tolerance is exhibited considering they were cut out of a single block of granite. They were not constructed out of pieces are beyond anything the ancient Egyptians could have possibly achieved with the technology our conventional Egyptologists tell us they possessed. And we're talking about people who haven't even invented the wheel yet. Okay. And they place these boxes, like how did they get underground to start with, and how did they even create them, in a small chamber where they are where you could barely walk around them. This is just one example of hundreds literally hundreds, not thousands, of similarly impossible to explain feats in construction, architecture, and art, not to mention medicine, geometry, and astronomy. I could be here all week citing the marvels that can be found in the Egyptian deserts, and these examples include only what is solid enough to have survived thousands of years. We have little extant evidence of their other less material accomplishments. So how did they do it? 
Of course, science, technology, and mystical thinkers have offered a plethora of explanations ranging from the implausible and the irrational, such as pulling 65-ton slabs of granite of man-made ramps surrounding the pyramids, or to the more plausible and rational theories of anti-gravity levitation using mind over matter. Okay, did you catch that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Which is more plausible and which is more implausible or irrational? Which seems like a more likely scenario of a material worldview does not limit the possibilities. Trying to fit these amazing feats into a strictly materialist paradigm is quite difficult and daunting. In the course of my research, I reviewed a large volume of texts on the subject of quantum physics, which could be a way of explaining these phenomena through the observer effect, which is the theory that consciousness creates physical reality by collapsing the quantum wave function of probability into concrete form through only an intention to do so. That's a very encapsulated description of what quantum physics is showing us, okay? <laughs> it's quite a bit more than that, but that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. Jung himself was quite interested in the relatively new science of theoretical physics and had quite a dialogue going with the eminent quantum physicist Wolfgang Pauli. Jung saw quantum physics as a natural progression from ancient alchemy through chemistry, culminating in the abstract world of subatomic particles, wave functions, and mathematics. There is also an anecdotal story of Jung having a conversation with his pots and pans at Bollingen, apologizing to them for having been away for so long. Apparently, they had been misbehaving. His talk seemed to have calmed them down. And this is a picture of him possibly talking to his pots. Not sure. His talk seemed to have calmed them down. And Marie Louise von Franz, a prominent student and ultimate colleague of Jung's, recounts his story in the Jung documentary Matter of the Heart and said, quote, it is naturally your own unconscious mixed up with it. It communicates with matter, unquote. Does quantum physics suggest that consciousness communicates and manipulates matter? Possibly so. Von Franz went on to write a book about the psyche's communication with matter titled Psyche and Matter, where she said, in the science of physics, the psyche mirrors matter. But that leads to the question, can matter mirror the psyche? The psyche to matter problem has been an age old issue and is in some way a foundational element of nearly every spiritual and religious system in the world. Very simply put, it presents the theory that material reality is first formulated in the psyche. In other words, our imaginal world precedes form. Quantum physics is only one idea that may be used as an explanation for the powers that are, were utilized in ancient Egyptian sacred science. One other is David Bohm's theory of the holographic universe, and another is Rupert Sheldrake's theory of morphic resonance. Sheldrake is a contemporary scientist, and is speaking this weekend at the Psyche and Matter Symposium at Joshua Tree. So he's actually here now. So what does any of this have to do with soul? Well, the word soul may be just a way to describe the non-material element that encompasses the construction and experience of reality. A reality that is comprised of material substance as well as this non-material essence. The word problem is associated with the phrase psyche to matter, because no materialist can comprehend a system where something unseen has effect on something material. Although we actually experience this all of the time through dreams, imagination, and numinous experiences, we have no materialist way to explain it. The psyche, or spirit, or imagination, or soul, or whatever you want to call it, are considered separate elements from the stuff of matter. Thus we exist in a dualistic cosmology. The ancient Egyptians very likely did not. The Egyptian integration of matter and psyche was so thorough and complete that with our current dualistic way of thinking, we have a difficult time understanding what it exactly meant. Most modern thinkers still describe the Egyptian funerary process, for example, in a limited, literal way, assuming that the Egyptians expected their mummified kings to rise from the dead eat the food left for them, ride the chariots buried with them, and partake in the, mystical, in the physical material objects surrounding their sarcophagi in their permanently sealed tomb buried deep in the earth. With this conclusion, we view the ancient Egyptians as highly superstitious and living an existence departed from reality. When in fact, they were a highly intelligent and sophisticated culture, it is quite difficult in our current materialist worldview <coughs> to hold two thoughts simultaneously 
as the Egyptians more than likely did in their apparent belief that a being could be physical and non-physical at the same time, with both realities blended in such a way that there was little or no distinction between the two. So again, <clears throat> what does any of this mean? And more appropriately, what does it have to do with psychotherapy? Some of the implications of this study are obvious. Many of the unseen elements of life have been marginalized by our materialist modern culture. Soul, love, kindness, spirituality. In some areas of life, they are considered important, such as in relationships or art, music, or literature. And in other areas, they are considered at best inconsequential and at worst invasive and counterproductive, such as in medicine, engineering, and the other art sciences. The theory I present here, which is not a new one, is that soul reintegrated into all aspects of our active reality will bring forth a greater expression and more fulfilling and effective creativity. Within the context of this study, the loss of soul in modern materialism is viewed as a result of the seemingly conscious choice to denote the subjective and imaginal inner world to a place of mere curiosity, if even that, rather than to give it a place of meaning, integral purpose, and equality with the objective material world. As I said, this is not a new idea. Jungian psychology is an example of a psychotherapeutic methodology that regards the imaginal inner world as a central part of its structure. In the early part of the 20th century, a spiritualist named Rudolf Steiner was a pioneer in the effort to integrate soul and spirituality into architecture, education, medicine, and even agriculture. Some of his efforts are still prominent today, such as in the Waldorf schools and biodynamic farming. Psychotherapist Robert Sardello, co-founder of the School of Spiritual Psychology, wrote, quote, we need Jung psychology in order to remain imaginal. We need Steiner's spiritual science in order to apply this imagination to the forming of the world. These two together make possible a conscious, imaginal sun alongside the sun of our usual earthly consciousness. That sounds very Egyptian. Jung's imaginal psychology and its therapeutic technique is probably the most likely psychotherapy modality that unintentionally, possibly unintentionally, incorporates the ancient Egyptian way of perceiving reality. However, most Jungian work stays within the confines of the psyche and ventures out into the material world only as consequence and through the rather detached results of the therapy. Steiner's work was intentionally in direct relation to the material physical world and was concerned with social and community development as well as individual accomplishment. He did not, however, see the spiritual world and the material world as separate. To him, as with the ancient Egyptians, the material world was infused with spirit. It can be argued that the whole purpose behind psychotherapy is to facilitate an individual's navigation through the material world, through relationship with others, community, and with the environment. However, Jungian death psychotherapy focuses on the imaginal inner world through dreams, active imagination, and unconscious complex processing. Sardello again illustrated this distinction, quote, Jung always traces the symptom back to an archetypal image, looks for the gods or spirits or dead in the disease, and speaks always of such figures as images in the soul. Steiner looks at the same symptoms and also traces the symptom back to the gods the spirits or the dead, but he takes these spirits as directly acting on the human being. Without Jung's perspective, these acts by spiritual beings would be taken literally as if they were just like earthly beings, except perhaps a little more shadowy. Without Steiner's perspective, on the other hand, the truth of the actual presence of spiritual beings is sidestepped. It is difficult to say whether Jung would have been more of a practitioner in the spirit of Steiner's philosophy if he had not been held back by the stigma of being labeled a mystic. In Gary Latchman's book, Jung and the Mystic, much is revealed about Jung's effort to remain the objective medical doctor and scientist in the public eye and suppress whatever mystical beliefs and understandings he may have held. It is clear, however, from Jung's interests and the topics he chose to write about that he had a prevailing fascination with the occult spirituality and parapsychology. Although it seems that Jung, Steiner, and others not mentioned here have in the past made a heroic effort to bring soul back into our materialist paradigm, maybe in our modern times as we continue their efforts, we have just not gone far enough. Or maybe we have actually given up the fight in many regards. I chose as my methodology alchemical hermeneutics, which is a phrase coined by Pacific Zone, Veronica Goodchild. 
and then expanded into a valid research methodology by Robert Romanushin. Romanushin describes this method as research with soul in mind, and as a method of freedom that is nonlinear in approach. It allows for twists and turns and spontaneous departures from a rigid or formulaic presentation. There may be no specific or objective conclusion or result, but rather a deeper sense of understanding or comprehension of the ideas being presented. Romanushin goes on to say in The Wounded Researcher, to do research with soul and mind is to be attuned to the fact that in one's work one is already being claimed by another story, and that one's work is already situated within a larger pattern, and that in one's work one is in service to something other than oneself. Within an imaginal approach, that larger tale to which one is in service is the unfinished business and the soul of the work, which makes its claims upon a researcher through his or her complexes for the sake of continuing that work. This unfinished business and the soul of the work lingers for a complex researcher <coughs> within the shadows of culture as the weight of history. I really could not have picked any other methodology considering the topic of this dissertation. I had to integrate soul into my process, and that I did using Romanusian's outline methods, and I found this method to have its greatest influence as I came to the conclusions of my research. Here, the entire project took a very personal turn. At the beginning of my work, I had hoped to come up with an actual methodology that could be universally applied on a more global scale, possibly a system that could be incorporated into any psychotherapy practice that would ensure a better integration of soul into the work, the infusion of spirit and spirits, a consciousness of the heart, psychotherapy as a sacred science. As I worked on my meditation, consulted my transference dialogues, as my methodology instructed me to do, and pursued my research with soul in mind, I kept coming up again and again with a highly personal perspective. I had dreams that were related to the research but were decidedly personal in nature. One such dream I presented and interpreted in the work. I heard music, which I also included in the work, and I had conversations with various people and entities that brought me personal enlightenment and understanding. So my conclusion, which I had hoped to be global in scope, is instead quite personal. The research experience with soul and mind guided me to convey a personal solution to the issues presented in this dissertation regarding the lack of soul in modern materialism, or more specifically, the lack of soul in the practice of modern psychotherapy. This is a personal journey for all of us as practitioners, to follow the wisdom of our hearts, to open up to the spirits that occupy the environment around us, and to embark on the journey into the underworld through each challenge with each patient we consult. And with each encounter of the mysterious that we stumble upon, coming out at the end, back into the light, more aware, more informed, and more in love than when we had begun. Now, like I said in the presentation, there was a lot of things that came to me through the work, and one of them was music. And so I did compose a piece that was inspired by the work, and I would like to, just in closing, to play that. I have to set this up.
great to even think of the music. Thank you. Thank you. Todd, by the way, is a composer in his first profession. You guys probably know that if you know Todd. Do you do it? Yeah. Yeah. For film and TV. Beautiful. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Michael Denny is one of the readers on Todd Hayden's dissertation committee, and he's here via speakerphone. And I'm wondering if we should start off, Dr. Denny, with a question from you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Yes. Um, first of all, let me also congratulate uh, Todd uh, on your uh, work here. I, it's just delightful to see some classical kind of um, history, history brought into depth psychology in this way. It's just beautiful. And how can we possibly thank you enough for that beautiful musical composition? I mean, what a perfect creative synthesis or conclusion to the data uh, for a dissertation at, at Pacifica. It's just wonderful. And um, so the question, uh, Todd, that, that raised in my mind, um, as you know, my work has to do with the union of matter and spirit uh, in the form of um, sort of medical stuff to uh, body and soul, and um, body and spirit, soma and, and psyche. And um, you, you talked about applying that um, in depth psychology, and I just wonder, you know, the, the one movement, uh, my work has been to try to bring that into the medical world, as you know, and I'm just, um, uh, I'm just, just thinking of how, how might this material that you've applied to depth psychology be brought to the psyche soma component of depth psychology. Um, we have going on in the country now like the, all the alternative medicine, so-called alternative medicine ways of healing that so far cannot be proved by our ordinary science. And I'm wondering um, if your work might be a beacon for us toward the union of that psyche and soma in medical care or in illness and healing. Thank you very much. Dr. Danny, thank you for your comments, too. I really do appreciate that. I tried to write in a harmonica solo in this piece, but, <laughs> but it, didn't, it didn't seem to lend itself to that, although I could probably do a version. Dr. Danny's a harmonica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. Now, that is the question, actually, I think, because it, you know, I know from my own experience with the medical system, with my first wife passing away um, of cancer 10 years ago, 11 years ago, uh, it, it, it was one of the primary inspirations for me to even go in this direction with this, with this work. Um, it's interesting, my answer to that would have been different before I did this, the research for this dissertation, because like I said in the presentation, I, I felt like the, the, the goal was to come up with some kind of system that we could at least begin to start utilizing. Uh, to teach or to become aware of in medicine or in any of the other sciences. And I kept getting pushed back into this, this is a personal matter. This is, this is about personal, very personal um, transformation. Not necessarily a transformation of a system, uh, a global system. But that global system would of course be transformed as a result of the personal uh, systems being transformed. Uh, but I, I think to answer it more objectively, I, I think what, what has to eventually come about is, is really, I mean, your work illustrates it much more than, uh, than anything that I could say, is that for doctors to become more aware in the system, the, the people operating the system become more aware of these non-material elements that certainly have a huge impact on healing. Uh, and, you know, it seems like a no-brainer to say this kind of thing now, but I think a lot of the system is still based on the idea that, that working materially with, with medicine and with illnesses and diseases, molecularly, whatever it might be, is the way to go. And that any of this mind-body connection is just kind of a, an annoyance to have to deal with in medicine. And certainly that is from your experience and from, I think, the experience of most people that actually go through it, realize that that's not what it's about. That we do have to become much more aware of these unseen forces that are around us uh, in order to heal the physical material body. I don't know if that's really getting, is that getting to, to the answer to your question or, or are you thinking more specifically? 
Uh, yes, no, Todd, that's, that's lovely stuff. And, and I do, um, again, my personal experience of your work and hearing you present today uh, does inspire me a little bit to maybe pursue this further. I'd love to spend some time with you now in the future that we can discuss some of this and see how that might overlay. Um, and, you know, the notion that we really need to change the whole culture, not, you know, not just the doctors, but there's a oh, whole yeah. cultural oh, yeah. scientism. Um, yeah. Dogma almost, yes. Oh, hugely, yeah. We were focusing on the medicine. I think we're so far, unfortunately, I do believe we're so far away from that becoming a global change in the foreseeable future that it's it's better, to, again, to work on it internally, individually. Uh, yeah. To become more, in, in, I don't like the word enlightened, but you know what I mean, to become more aware of the importance, just like the Egyptians did. They, they put credence into into what we consider nowadays psychosis almost. I mean, and this is one of the problems with integrating this, this new idea and this paradigm into our modern thought is that, you know, if we start believing there's the, the reality around us is infused with spirits and, and you know, we would be considered psychotic because we're, we're seeing things, we're hallucinating or whatever it might be. So it's, it's one of the dangers in, in kind of pursuing this idea. But, but I think it can be pursued in, in smaller steps than that. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Great, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you very much. Great question. And yeah, I would love to talk to you more about it. I mean, it's a huge question. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, there's also a question that is written in from the external reader, Dr. Robin Van Lobenzels, who couldn't be on the phone today. And she's back in New York, so she's... I know would be present, but she wrote in a question, okay. which I'll read to you. Todd, clearly your dissertation proceeds from your experience of individuation. You recognize that versions of an application of the ancient Egyptian cosmology of sacred science and consciousness of the heart can be found in several applied psychologies, depth psychology, transformative psychology, spiritual psychology, but you suggest that your work provides an additional nuance that lies at the heart of Jung's work. Can you be more explicit about that nuance? Great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's that's a good question. I mean, it's hard it's hard to say because I I have no study to uh, to compare what I do as being different than what other people do or what Jung intended or what anybody that followed Jung. Um, and again, it I guess the difference, if there is any, about what I do or how I approach psychotherapy is that I do believe, or I'm beginning to as much as I can, believe in the unseen as being the reality in our, not just in the psyche, not just in the, the dream world of the psyche. And I believe Jung believed this too, he just didn't talk all that much about it because, you know, he had to stay within those, those limits of what he was doing. But that there, that there is a reality, I don't know really how to deal with it in the real world just like I was just saying, about the psychosis idea or, or whatever. But I do cite in my, in my dissertation about some of my, some of my cases, just kind of like con conglomerations of things. But talking about things like I've had, I've had clients that say they believe in fairies and they believe in, you know, quite literally that they do, although they've never seen one, they believe they exist. And, and I think that, that for me, it's my approach to that, because I believe in that too, and I believe that they're, the reason we may not see them is just because we don't really believe in it or whatever. I mean, believe is a, is a hard word. Um, it's, uh, God, that's such a good question. I, I would like to think that in my work, um, I go beyond that. I don't stay in the, in the inner world of, of a client and a patient. If they want to go into the into the outer world of, of, of dealing with a reality that they see that we, we consider unreal because it's not physical, that I actually sincerely deal with that as, as if it is a, a real thing. And I, I know that's not necessarily, you know, out there, because uh, I know a lot of other practitioners do that as well. But it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to do because we're, we're tied into, you know, Again, psychosis and psychiatry and medication and, and functioning in society and all of that. But, um, am I am I on the right track with answering that? 
Oh, she just told me it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask a question that follows up a little bit on what you're saying. If you think of traditional psychiatry, traditional psychology, you know, we have a term, magical thinking. Uh huh. Right. Right. Which you alluded to the problem of psychotic thinking, mm -hmm. something that your work opens up as a tension or something to be addressed. Magical thinking, in the traditional way of describing it, right, is not good. It's not a good thing if you're engaging like a, in magical thinking according to, according to the, the conventional, conventional traditional thing. psychiatric model, right? Mm -hmm. It's the sense that you're seeing inner things as if they were outside. Right. 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 Which is a bad thing. That's a bad thing. Yeah. That's a distortion of right. reality. Now your work is, is challenging that notion. Yeah. Big and time. I, and I big time, right? Yeah. And I also I want to ask you a question by giving you an example from my mm -hmm. experience and get your take on how this might for you apply more to deaf psychology into your practice. Um, so this, this was my experience in doing active imagination for the first time, Jung's you know, technique of working with inner imaginal realities. Um, the first time I was doing that, I was working with an analyst in Switzerland, and I was working on a certain problem in my life through active imagination, and within a couple weeks it seemed to me as if the whole outer situation had changed, as if the people involved had changed. You know, and it was striking to me. And so I asked my analyst I was working with over the phone, I said, he was in Switzerland, so we were over the phone, and I said, God, you know, it's, um, it's just strict. It's like, this is like magic. I could, I imagine it seems like magic. You know, and I was expecting him to tell me, well, this is projected. I think. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, right. and instead right. he said, yeah, it is. <laughs> 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 and I always remembered that. Um, and I was wondering if you could address that, just getting into the practice of deaf psychology with some of the ideas that you're raising. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I, I kind of wonder if there's this, and maybe I can ask any of the people, or analysts, or people that work with people, you know, this, this idea, I mean, how much of this do we, do we suppress, do we push down and go, well, we're not going to really say this is real and this is magic, we're going to stay within the confines of the system or else, you know, ethically can we keep our jobs and, you know, whatever it might be. And you wonder if when you actually present it, it's like, yeah, okay, you got it. That is what it is. It is magic. Because I think, and I know this may be really subtle, but I think there is a little very thin line there that you can cross or not cross. That you can say, no, 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 it's still projection. It's still, it's still in the imaginal world. It's not considered real like this is, but it's important to like look at and mess with. And, and I think that the, that distinction, and although it's subtle, and we have no way to know what it feels like to, to think the way the Egyptians may have thought. We don't even know if they really thought that way. But that little line there, I think, is the whole thing. It's like if we can go into a world where we give equal time, credence, importance, whatever the words you want to say, to what we would consider magical thinking, then we will change everything radically. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can't even radically is not even the right word. Yeah. You know, because this, this material reality is, as we say it is the only real reality there is, has limited us so much that, you know, and, and in my work, yeah, I, I would go there. I mean, I would think that, and it's really hard to do. I have one, one patient that was hospitalized after two sessions with me who would be considered like dangerous, you know. Uh, I think he was diagnosed schizophrenic, and, and he had all kinds of, you know, he spoke to, to people, they, to, they talked to him, these spirits ever since he was three years old, you know, all this classic stuff. And I think if he was in an environment where that was treated respectfully, or treated, treated in a way that, you know, okay, this is, this is real, let's see how this is working in this whole thing, he would not be hospitalized. He would not go out and threaten people because he was frustrated, he was terrified, he was all of these things. But he gets thrown in this system that, forget it. Yeah, it's like, you know, and I know this is all standard stuff. I'm reading a book now called Mad in America, and it's about the history of psychiatry with lobotomies and insulin coma therapy and all this. And it is amazing what people just 
50, 60 years ago, diagnosed illness, mental illness as being. You know, some, some guy grew a beard and was a beatnik in the 60s, and they actually put in his record that his symptoms of insanity was that he had a beard. You know, was in, I mean, you know, so we're still thinking that way. Of course, we're a little more broad than what we're thinking, I hope. <laughs> Don't like crazy people in here. Okay, um, but uh, but not that far. You know, it's like magical thinking still in the books. It's still in the books as being considered, you know, pathological. Am I am I answering it at all? Absolutely. No, I really appreciate hearing your take on yeah. your perspectives. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Do you think that Jung's Unfolding view about the psychoid archetype. Mike, are you still there? Sorry, I'm gonna have to call him back. I said, Psychoid? Psychoid? Yeah. 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 The research that's been done on near-death experiences and similar phenomena where, for example, in uh, the, the book Proof of Heaven that was written by a neuro Harvard trained... Mm -hmm. Hello! Hi! Hello. Hi. We're, we're back. Sorry about that problem. Uh, I know you can't see me, but I'm still here on us. It's real. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely real. And we can prove it materialistically. So. I don't know how, but... <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm just wondering, because it seems that there seem to be these areas where, well, just to go back to that particular author, uh -huh. who, as he says at the beginning of his book, uh, if you couldn't have chosen a more materialistic, you know, scientist, uh, after his near-death experience, completely uh, said I was wrong. You know that the experiences that he had were not just symbolic mm -hmm. psychologically; they were experiences absolutely real, mm -hmm. which they are in a lot of these sorts of experiences. And I'm just wondering if this kind of growing body of knowledge will help move this idea of an interworld or an imaginal world that is peopled by real beings, not just symbol uh, beings that are... Symbol objective beings. Exactly. This yeah. is, this, right when I first started writing mm -hmm. this dissertation, I was corrected by one of our friends, Dr. Nadler, which, which was great, because he said, you keep using the word subjective as the inner world. And he said, there is an objectivity to the inner world as well. That's very important. And is that kind of what you're yeah, talking about yeah. there? That, that it isn't just, there is a consensus to it. There is an objectivity to it. To, to the spirits and to the right. imaginal and to things. Yeah. yeah. I, I do believe that we are certainly in, in much, much of the Western developed world where, where we occupy, you know, what we occupy, um, that we are moving toward an awareness and understanding of that. I mean, we're breaking down the dogmas of, of religious, historical religion which was very dogmatic and, and self-serving to a certain population of people, primarily powerful men in the church, you know. We're moving away from that, or at least understanding that there's something more to it than that. You know, we're going back to the hermetical texts, we're going back to the original thinking of those of those areas. So yeah, I do, and, and, and my, my hope is that this hundredth monkey idea kind of takes hold. Is everybody familiar with that? This this idea that after and Rupert Sheldrake talks a lot about this. That you reach a point where the morphic fields start to get penetrated in or become penetrated, or you know people penetrate into them as as a mass group, as opposed to everybody having to get it all at the same time or over a period of time. Is that is that close yeah. to what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. yeah I I have hope that that. We're all part of that, you know, in this work. Yeah. So, Todd, I um, really appreciated your presentation. I was very interested in the, you know, the history and the images and everything. And I was thinking, you know, you've done some really solid research here. But in answer to the questions, what's the original piece? I felt it in your composition. Oh, thank you. And so, wow. my question That's to good. you is. Yeah. Um, do you listen differently 
because of the research that you did for your d dissertation and in the way that you listen as you compose, is there, is that where the originality that's unique to your personal takes it to someone else or to the collective? I think that's exactly what it is, if I understand what you're saying. And that's the reason why I can't really put it into words. Yeah. And one of the primary reasons that. why I play the piece. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if, you know, the, the, what it is that I am and what it is that I understand about this, this work was focused on that essence of who I am was in that piece of music. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not written down. We can't sit there and go, oh, Todd's saying this and he learned this and this is what's happening. But you feel it when you hear it. Well, and it's, you shifted from the atonal to the melodic. Yeah. It's such a, um, I just went, oh, there. <laughs> now I'm in this other place. Uh -huh. Here's yeah. this, and here's how they synthesize together. Right. Right. And I had such a sense of peacefulness hearing that. And so that mm -hmm. says to me that this, my interpretation, mm -hmm. is that you are in a peaceful place. And that's expressed oh, okay. in the music about this work and this question that you have. Because you wrote this out of... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is your... No, I actually, I hadn't thought of that, and I, I like that. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. Because that's, you know, that's where it is. It's like in the work, that's why it's very hard to describe, like, what do you do? What is your methodology? You know, what are you doing different? And I don't know if we can say that. It's like we go into it one way and we come out, huh? Not yet. Yeah, right. You will. You know, one of my, one of my first composition teachers, uh, when I when I started school, I of course wanted to write like Beethoven and like all the old guys and whatever. And he, and he was like he was a real avant-garde writer. And he said you can't do this. And I go why not? And he said because Beethoven never flew on an airplane, and you have. Mm -hmm. And no matter how hard you try to write like him, that is going to be in there. Mm -hmm. And that has stuck with me. You know, it's like. You can't unlearn these things, you can't unexperience. And when you experience the experience you experience, when you work with a client, that's there. Mm -hmm. No matter how subtle it might be, it's mm -hmm. there. And so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I don't know. That's what somebody left the 4X. <laughs> I just wanted to say, that um, both the presentation visually and with the music was such a beautiful, for me, integration of who I, my experience of you, oh, who I you. know you to be. And you have evolved to more, and um, I expect more from you. Thank you. That's very sweet. And I look forward to it. Thank you, JD. I'm so happy you're here. I was thinking about you all the way up. Thank you. Right. Well, maybe we, this is a place to stop for now. Okay. I will go outside and convene with the committee and return with the decision. <laughs> 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 okay, so ten minutes or so. Okay, great. Oh God. Uh, Want to hear some more music? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> no. <laughs>